So we're going to look at the, the letter that Paul wrote to Titus over the next three weeks and look at what he told Titus. Hey, this, you're getting ready to set this church up. Here are the kind of things that you should be looking for. Here's the things you should be looking out for. By definition, that means it allows us to kind of give you some insight into who Ablaze is and how we operate. So let's just get into Scripture together. If you want to open up to Titus 1, verse 1, we'll jump right into it. So here's the letter. It starts off, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Okay, it's going to take us a little while to get through the salutation because it's just chock full of things. So the truth, what is the truth? Well, we see scripture, we understand scripture to be God's truth. At a blaze, we take scripture very, very seriously. Most of the people who have been around here for a while have read through the whole Bible. Um, sometimes in a year, sometimes as a team, sometimes over a period of time. But because we understand scripture is true, it's accurate, it's inerrant, even in the form we have, there, even, we're just blessed to have it in English, as Nick said, and access to it. But how do we know that? How do we know it's the truth? And so when we look at scripture, when we kind of, actually when I became a Christian, I have a little bit of a science background, a business background. My mind has to, everything has to fit. It all has to work. Nothing can kind of be, well, I don't know. I'll try to figure that out in the future. I really do need all of it to make sense. And so that was the case with scripture. I had to understand where did it come from? How was it put together? Can I trust it? So my research show, took me to these places. Of course, over the last 35 years, my research has taken me lots of other places as well. But here's what I'll just give you the, the thumbnail sketch of why I believe and we believe Scripture is valid, true, and something we can really depend on. So you look at it, it's a book written over a 1,500-year period of time by 35 or 36 authors. And in it is an Old and a New Testament. So the Old Testament. The Old Testament was put together and what was so amazing about it is it's filled with so many things, data, facts, archaeological, you know, geographic, cultural things, that you can verify it. You can go back and dig up right beside the, the, uh, the, the Sea of the, Jordan, uh, the River Jordan, and lo and behold, there's a Jericho there with the ruins that are exactly as described in Scripture. And over and over and again, the temple is exactly where it was in the phases as the scripture um, shared. So there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that could be verified. Also in the Old Testament are prophecies about the Messiah and when he would come, both the first and the second coming of the Messiah. Those prophecies, very, you know, there's many of them. Sometimes you see 100, sometimes you see 58, sometimes you see a, a variety of numbers. But let's just use a few the prophecies all came true in the life of Jesus. So you say, well, if you're going to make up your own religion, and you're just going to, well, why don't you just go and you'll just write those prophecies in the old thing, and then you have it as access, right? So it verifies itself. And until 1948, we actually didn't really know if that's not what might have happened. But in 1948, we found copies of the Old Testament that are 200 years older than Jesus. And you know what they said? The exact same thing as the scriptures that we have today. The Dead Sea Scrolls validate the fact that the Old Testament hasn't changed in thousands of years. The whole telephone game kind of fallacy didn't happen, and we have proof of that in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is true, and the prophecies all came true. Statistically, if just 12 of those prophecies came true, not all of them, but all 58, but just 12, it would be statistically impossible for the Old Testament to not be divine, literally. So we've got the Old Testament. It's been validated. It's got multiple writers validating, corroborating themselves. History corroborates. Everything corroborates the Old Testament. So, and it hasn't changed in thousands of years. The New Testament. How do we know the New Testament is true? Well, the New Testament is eight eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus here on earth. People, men who were willing to die instead of change their story. Go to any court in the world and get two or three witnesses that all have the same story, and the person's going to get convicted. Tell those witnesses, you're going to die if you don't change your story. Most of them will change their story just to keep from dying. These eight guys did not do that. That's pretty valid from my perspective. So I said, God, if you're real, I want to know you, and, I wanna, and I'll follow you if you're real. And so I started praying, and I started asking God, God, will you show yourself to me? 
and he did. And he did. And I've known him for a long time now, and I talk to him. He talks to me, not in a weird kind of way, but in a great kind of way, in a, in a way that, that you'll just see o- over time how that unfolds. But we've got that part of it. Actually, the Bible is, we, we say this a little bit, I don't know if it's tongue-in-cheek, but we, we're stuck with it. It's true, it's accurate, whatever it says, whether we like it or not, this is what Scripture says. So we let Scripture inform how we think about whatever we see or hear, we just do, because we know that it's true. So one of those things that's in Scripture, I already read that word, and this is going to tell you something else about a blaze. The word elect to the elect is who he wrote this letter, those elect in Crete. So what do we mean by elect? So again, maybe depending on your background in terms of church, you might have looked at things like election, and you might have looked at things like sovereignty and free will and how all that meshes together. That is literally a sermon series, and there are thousands of books on the series in the, in the topic, and there have been debate in Christendom for hundreds of years on exactly how that works. I'm not going to go this topic. We, we, we do talk about that at times. I'm not going to take you through the master class on how all of salvation, election, and sovereignty works. What I will tell you is this. What I will tell you is this, is a blaze is somewhere in the middle. If you are saved, you are saved by grace through faith. That is a gift from God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. You are not saved by your works. You're not saved because you were more clever. You figured it out and nobody else did. You were saved because Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. You were saved because the Holy Spirit prompted you, drew you, encouraged you, and you said, I want in. I want you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. And even the faith it took to get there was a gift from God. However... However, the idea that God controls everything and every single thing you do or I do or other people or lost people do is controlled by God is kind of refuted in James 1, 13 through 15, where it says, don't say that God is tempting you because God can't tempt you. He doesn't tempt you. He's not tempted by evil himself. Rather say you, your flesh, you were drawn away, you sinned, and then sin led to, you were tempted, sin led to death and then Um, and then, of course, separation from God. That's what it says. Don't say God's tempting you. He doesn't tempt you. So he's not doing that. He's not making you sin. Let me put it that way. We do not believe that God is making you sin, and we think Scripture accepts that. So I guess the way I would put it is, in terms of election, if you're saved, it happens the way that most of those, you know, that kind of theology would accept. In terms of damnation, I think we have some ability to reject God, and we do. And you as believers, you do, don't you? Do you ever do something you know is not pleasing to God? He's not all about that. He's not making you do that, and that's what James 1 says. So again, like, what is that level? I guess that's where we stand, is we're kind of in the middle. There is some desire on God's part for there to be a mutual relationship. He does all the drawing, but it looks to us like in Scripture you can choose to reject that. You can ha- choose to have your name blotted out of the name, Lamb's Book of Life. That's how Scripture describes that and talks about that. So it's a very deep topic. I'm not trying to, I, mean, I don't, I don't want to get too far into that other than to say we're somewhere in the middle there, and I think that's just an important distinction of who we are because we do think there is something about that. In fact, here's my, when I look at the Scripture, I believe it talks about a story that says this, God desires a genuine two-way relationship with all who will. God desires a genuine two-way relationship with everyone who will enter into it. He wants that genuineness. He wants that connection. Jesus actually, when he says, what do we need to be saved? He was asked, what do I need to be saved? He said, the only work you need to do is to accept Jesus Christ, the one whom he has sent. So it's easy on our part. The rejecting part, that's the part where that's on us. God's not making you reject or making people reject. That's my understanding. Okay? So that tells you a little bit about us. So we've gotten through two lines here. Let's keep going in Scripture. I did take two weeks on a half a verse one time, but that's, that's unusual. All right. So what else does it say? A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. 
So here is a reality about Ablaze. One of the things that we talk about all the time is we are not living for this world. We're not citizens of this world. We're not citizens of this country, first and foremost. We're living for eternity. We're citizens of heaven. And that changes our perspective about everything. Everything changes when you stop thinking, well, what am I going to do the next thing? What am I going to do the next thing? And you start thinking, wait a minute, eternity matters, and it's way longer than this life. What am I doing today that's affecting eternity as well? How am I living? How's that going? So, again, we believe Jesus is coming back again, and he's going to take those whom believe in him and will be with him forever in heaven, and that's eternal life. Another whole cool sermon with that, too. God doesn't lie. This is another thing that, that we believe here is the verse that says, God does not lie. It also says that in, in Hebrews 13. God doesn't lie. He promised before the beginning of time, and at this appointed season, he brought his word to light. Okay, so God doesn't lie. He says he's going to do this. This is the one thing that I noticed in Scripture. God keeps his promises, but he doesn't necessarily always keep his threat. Study that. We can go over that more through, this, through, the, uh, through the time, through this, this semester, the next semester. But there are a lot of times when he doesn't keep his threats. He, by grace and mercy, gives people another chance, another opportunity. But every, every, every promise he makes, every statement, I'm going to do this, and it's a promise, it's a positive thing, he keeps. I have a lifetime, we have a lifetime of proof that he does that because he is so faithful. I love that song. He's so faithful. He's such a good God. He's so good. I sang that all week. I don't know. It just got stuck in my head. I guess it's going to be stuck for another week, which is, so, which is totally fun. All right. So at this time, he brought his word to light through the preaching he entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. All right. Those of you who know Paul, Paul's story, Paul was on the road to go kill Christians. He's on the road to go try to destroy Christianity, and Jesus himself appeared to him and on the road, and he commissioned Paul to go take the gospel to the Gentile world, okay? So what does this scripture say? Paul says he was commanded by God our Savior, all right? Another doctrine that we believe wholeheartedly and scripture teaches clearly is that Jesus is God. There's a trinity, God is three being, three uh, manifestations of the same being, one being, um, again, another whole sermon, but that's one thing we believe, that, that Jesus is God. He says in, in John, we see that Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am, referencing the burning bush story where God says, who should I say sent me? God says, tell them I am sent you. Jesus says, I am. And, of course, they picked up stone to kill him because they knew that he was claiming to be God. Another thing you see is Jesus says you should worship no other gods but God. And then constantly lets people worship him. Why? Because he's God. Jesus is God. Fully God, fully man. That's one of the things we believe foundationally here at Ablaze. What did he, Paul, what was Jesus commissioning Paul to teach? He was commissioning Paul to teach the gospel. And that is all of us, no matter how good you've been, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. I have. And the wages of sin, what I deserve, what I have earned, what the consequences should be of my sin is death. Spiritual death separated from God forever. But God doesn't want that. He desires a genuine two-way relationship with all who will. And so Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, and at the end of his life he died but he didn't die to pay the price for his own sin because he didn't have any. He died to offer to pay the price for yours and mine. That's the message that Paul was given to go share. And it says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, God, that he's God, believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be if you do enough good things, but you will be saved. Now, everybody says, well, shouldn't you do good works? Well, duh, of course you should. Why shouldn't you? If you knew that the God of the universe loves you so much and wants so much good for you that he came and lived and died, if you know that to be true so that you could be in an eternal, perfect relationship with God forever, 
Why wouldn't you respond by doing something good to others? How could you not, knowing what's been done for you? The only reason I think we don't is we forget how good we've been treated. How we've been treated, not like we deserve, but, but like how, God, how Jesus was, deserved to be treated. We, we're treated like children of God, and we can be confident in that. That's one of the things I was... I take a trip every summer, typically with lost people, because I love hanging around with lost people and sharing the gospel with them. And, and, I, and I was with them, and, and that's one of the things that was so, how can you be sure? How can you be so certain? And so I, share, I got an opportunity to share about how scripture is and what scripture says and my relationship with God, my intimacy with him, and my, all those things I could share in detail because God wants you to be sure. He doesn't want you to live in doubt and fear. He wants you to live in victory. And what that victory leads to is, yes, of course, you love God and love others. Of course you do, because that's what he says is best for you. That's the other thing we say about Scripture. Scripture is not written to put walls and borders around you so that you don't have any fun. When God says, don't lie, he's not saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hate you if you lie. Because here's another thing, just, just so you know this. God can't love you any more than he already does. He can't, love, no matter what you do, good or bad, he can't love you any more than he already does. So that's not going to change your relationship with God. Your, your actions, your behaviors are not going to. So why do good works? Why not lie? Let's just start with lying. Why not lie? Because God, your Father, knows that if you lie, people aren't going to trust you. And that's not good. That's not good. He said, well, why shouldn't you commit adultery? He says, because if you do that, it's going to destroy your family. It's going to destroy your life. It's going to destroy all the people around you. It's not good for you to commit adultery. Why not engage in pornography? He says, he says because it's not good for you. And I love you. I'm not trying to keep you away from porn. I'm trying to keep you towards what's good for you. What's healthy for you? I made you. I know what's best. Trust me in this. That's the one thing that I want to say about Scripture. Whether we like it or not, you, you look at it and you go, man, a God that adores you. Not a God that's just sitting there wanting to smack you upside the head. A God that adores you. A good father says these things are not good for you and these things are good for you. And he knows what he's talking about. Good, that... that he knows what he's talking about. So that's how I approach scripture, is that if he says something's good, it's good. If he says something's bad, it's probably not good for me. And I might not see the negative consequences or the positive consequences immediately. Sometimes you do good works in silence and quiet, and you don't even, nobody notices. So what? God does. It might be a million years from now, and all of a sudden God whips out that, you know, remember you did this thing? Awesome, I've got this thing in heaven for you to, go, to do and be a part of. We don't know that, but we know what scripture says. Loving other people, serving other people, helping other people is how God's designed us. So that's why we do good works. That's why we do good works, because it's, it's the best way to live. It's the best way to live. It's the most enjoyable. It's the healthiest way to live. Okay, so almost finished the salutation to Titus, uh, my true son, in our uh, common faith, grace and peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior. All right. So what, is he, what does he jump into next? The next thing he jumps into is this idea of having uh, leadership there in Crete as he leaves. So Paul, uh, T uh, Titus is getting ready to leave. He's saying, I'm going to set up some leadership here. How did you do this, God? Or, or, or Paul. The reason I left Crete um, was that you might straighten out, left you there, so you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So he's saying, listen, one of the things that, again, whether we like this or not, in, in America in 2023, is that there is structure that God has designed. There's structure that he's designed. And that structure is good for us. It's healthy for us. It's helpful for us. If we operate in it the way he's designed it. Okay? So let me just go uh, give you a couple pieces here. Um, he's going to set up leadership. He's going to set up leadership. And Jesus talks specifically with his disciples about what good leadership looks like, okay? Good leadership looks like what Jesus did. Good leadership looks like laying your life down for the people who you're leading. 
not lording it over them, not trying for money, not trying to be fame or glory or anything else, but the ability to just serve the people you're leading. That's what he set up. Paul describes this in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, where he talks about the families and some structure in the family. He says, husbands, you're not going to like this. If you read this verse, you're not going to like this. But here's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to lay your life down for your family, for your wife and for your family, the way Christ laid his life down for the church. That's the role that he's given fathers and dads and husbands. Lay your life down like Jesus did for the church. What did Jesus do? He gave up everything. He gave up everything for the church. It wasn't all about his pride, what he wanted to do, what his agenda was. He gave up everything for the church. The verse right before that is one where Paul talks about wives. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, just as he submitted to the Father. So what is beautiful about a, a God-honoring structure in the family is the way it models Jesus' life. Jesus fully submitted to the Father. He didn't say, well, I don't like what you're doing. I'm, I'm going to do my own way. He said, whatever you say, Lord. I might not like something, and I'm going to beg you to take it away. If you can take this cup, that'd be awesome. But I'm going to do it anyway if you say it's good for me. And he said, to, and then, of course, he sacrificed himself on the cross for us. And so he gave us that. All right, one more thing about how we figure out whether something is a scripture we like, something is a scripture we're going to anchor ourselves on, is this. We had an exercise last semester. We do this on a regular basis, but we had an exercise last semester that was looking at all the doctrine in Scripture. We had a whole Excel spreadsheet of all the different doctrine and all the different things about Scripture that people cling to or believe, and we said, listen, let's go through and put them all in jars, priority jars. Jar one is salvation if we don't agree that Jesus is God, if we don't agree that he came back to life, if we don't agree that that substitution is what saves us, then we're probably not in the same book. <laughs> we're probably not in the same group that, that we're separate. So item one, jar one, is salvation-based issues. Jar two are commands, clear, understandable, multiple places in Scripture commands. Jar three would be things that we lean towards, we understand, they're, pr they're principles we follow. And jar four would be preferences. Do we have a screen or do we not have a screen? Seriously, it might be jar five. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> God decided we're not going to have a screen. But, here's it, so that, but think about that exercise. Some of you, and, and we noticed this in our group, some people had not thought, why do I believe this? Where in Scripture is this written? How many times in Scripture? Is it consistent from the Old to the New Testament? Is it, is it, is it, is it like unchanged? And I will say, and I'm not going to beat this too much other than just this next thing, we believe that elders in the church are required, we are required as men to be elders in the church. That is a role that God, we're going to see this in scripture, so we're just going to read it together. But I want to explain why, because it gives you a context of how we think about things. If you look at the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam a certain responsibility. He gave Adam a certain responsibility, and in that responsibility, it was to lead Eve. You say, well, what do you mean? How do you know that? Weren't they equals in the garden before the fall? The answer is no. How do we know that? In Romans, it says that sin entered the world through one woman, Eve, when she ate the apple, right? It does not say that. It says sin entered the world through one man, Adam. He was responsible for her actions because he didn't lead. He didn't man up. He didn't do what he was supposed to do and say, honey, that's not right. We're not eating that apple. I'm, I'm responsible for this. God told me we got to not eat the apple. Okay, so you see it there. You see it in Jesus' life when he had a chance to appoint elders in the church. You see it in the way eldership is appointed in Timothy, and you see it in the structure of the family in Ephesians. And that's just what we understand Scripture to say, whether we like it or not. So, what are the limitations of what women can do at a blaze? Almost nothing. 
almost nothing. The only thing that the Bible seems to clearly say is something that men are required to do is to be the elders of the church and the husbands, the leaders of the family spiritually. We see that in Scripture. We can't do anything about it, whether we like it or not. It's really clear in Scripture. And if you struggle with that, I would love to talk to you more. Don't just ghost this and peace out, because I think it's important to understand how do you interpret Scripture? Because that's going to apply to every other piece of Scripture, or every other doctrine that you, that you look at or think about. It just is. And so, again, how do you wrestle with Scripture? So for us, this is something that's talked about from, again, Genesis 2 all the way to the end of Scripture. And we're, that's, <laughs> that's how we have to understand it. So what does it say? He says, an elder must be blameless. Okay, so there are nobody <laughs> that can be qualified to be an elder, but... This concept of dealing with things and working through things and nobody holding something against you. Timothy has a similar thing, above reproach. The husband of but one wife. So again, somebody that's been through a lot of different marriages, somebody that's been uh, having multiple wives at the same time, not qualified to be an elder here. Okay. If your divorce, let me just give you an aside, if your divorce was as a Christian, then you probably wouldn't end up being an elder at a blaze unless there was adultery or the unbelieving wife left. Those are the two things that Scripture sort of says, hey, this is okay, that that marriage can be annulled, if you will, from God's perspective. If it's just like, well, we didn't get along anymore, we just gave up, it's going to be tough for us because that, unless unless you were an unbeliever when that happened, then all kinds of things have, have changed. So, a husband and but one wife. A man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Somebody was asking me about this. They were saying, well, so what is the, what can you do as a, uh, as a father, a a parent to sort of like be a good Christian leader in training? Well, listen, you should be discipling your children First and foremost, moms, dads, that's one of your primary mission fields, your children. And if you can't do that, why would God put you in responsibility for other people? Now, does every single child of every single pastor go well, make out well? Some not so much. (laughs) Some not so much. Sometimes it's the pastor's fault because they were too something. It's just true. Sometimes it's the fact that the child just went astray. And that's not 100% on the, on, the, on the parent every single time. But if you've got four children and three of them are making it, you're probably not qualified to be an elder. Maybe even if two of them are not making it, you're probably not qualified to be an elder. That's just the reality of what this scripture says. Because if you can't even lead your household well. Now maybe you've changed, maybe you got saved later in life, and maybe that, there's all kinds of extenuating circumstances. But if you've raised your kids in a Christian household and they totally reject God, maybe it's, you shouldn't be a pastor at a church. Okay. My son's doing pretty well. <laughs> He's one of the pastors here. Um, so that's the beginning there. Um, Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless and not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as he had been taught, which we've been talking about, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. One of the things that is a focus of a blaze, and this is one of the reasons we like being a relatively small church, is that we are focused on helping raise up Christian leaders. That is what is our main focus here. So if you feel like, wow, when I get out of school, I want to be a a, a better leader in the kingdom of God. If I'm in the core or the military, I want to be leading Bible studies or starting churches on base. I, I want to be in that place spiritually and equipped to do that. This is a good place for you. This is a good place for you because that's what we're all about. And not only leaders, but healthy leaders. Evelyn and I helped start an organization. It's a national, I guess there's a few international members, but a national organization to help pastors around the country to help raise up healthy leaders. 
And so it's just a group. I think we had our conference, about 150 people came to our last conference in Miami. And our goal is just to help them help their leaders to be healthy. So after we go through Titus and we talk about what the Bible says and you get a sense of who we are and how we operate as a church, the next series we're going to go through is about being a healthy Christian and understanding a little more about how God might desire, how God does desire to heal us, even emotionally. Even emotional brokenness is something God wants to be a part of. And so we're going to spend some time over the course of the semester talking about how God can do that and some things we can do to be be healthier um, leaders. And a lot of that's going to be just really getting close and intimate with the Lord and abiding in Christ and knowing who we're designed to be. But some of it's going to be, you know, there's some things out there, there's some resources out there that we need to take advantage of. God didn't just, um, <laughs> Emily's gone, but God didn't just say, well, you don't need medicine anymore. You don't need doctors anymore. You know, you can just come and I can just heal people. He, he trained and equipped certain people with gifts of healing. So Emily, who <laughs> I'm talking about her, but she's not here. She's over with the children. She's a PA. She's a, she's a physician's assistant and a healer. And she feels like God's designed her to help heal people physically. My other son-in-law is a a, a counselor, a neuroscience major here and a counselor in Florida because he believes God's called him to heal people emotionally. And I've been, and I I just give you some personal, I've been healed emotionally over some pretty deep woundedness from my childhood. And I think God wants that to be, he wants us to be healed and healthy. He wants that for us. He doesn't want us to stay broken. And I think that's part of here. When you see not violent, not, not greedy, not drunkenness, not quick-tempered, I think some of that are symptoms of our woundedness that God wants us to overcome and just put behind us. So that's going to be sort of our next uh, series after this. So anyway, he's gone in, he's appointed elders, and he's, and he's the next little piece of it, I'm not going to go in too much because he rails against the people who are teaching false doctrine, okay? That's not good. We're not going to do that. We're, we're a church here. We're going to help each other. You can, you can come to us if you think we're teaching false doctrine. That's fine. But as a church, that's not our role. We're not going to go out and rail on people who are teaching false doctrine. Other people can do that. We're going to try to learn the truth. And we're going to do that by studying God's word And we're going to challenge you to be in God's word every day, all the time, every day. It's it's a cheat code. It seriously is. It's a cheat code for life. God has designed us and he's given us the manual. And so we're going to just encourage you to use it. The other reason we want you to use it is because when I say things up here, when Nick says things up here, we want you to know what scripture says and go, I'm not sure how that fits. Let's talk about it. We don't want you to go, oh, they said it must be true. We want you to know it yourself. Because we're not going to be there all the time when temptations happen and struggles happen. And we're not going to be there all the time. And the Bible, the Word of God can be with you all the time. And that's where we want. We want it buried in your heart, not sitting on a shelf. Let me pray for you guys.